side three. There's a roundabout of such consummate ugliness on the Galway Ring Road that it would have been refused planning permission in New Jersey. You'd never dream you were within a mile of one of the loveliest city centres in the country. A tawdry mall of video boutiques and foam-backed carpet emporia festers beneath the arch of the giant M. Christ, you think, get me out of this place before I see the cut-price exhaust centre or world of leather. It's unseasonably hot as I drive into the city, and the place is seething with people. My B&B &B is a splendid old house built in the 1730s, with stone walls two feet thick and the sea just a few hundred yards away. There's a sign in my bathroom that says, No smoking on Sundays and holy days. Like every B&B &B landlady I've encountered so far, Mrs. O'Flaherty is an honours graduate of a course in Celtic hospitality studies entitled Be True to Your Most Eccentric Instincts. She's a big woman in a tweed skirt and what I eventually conclude, having eliminated all other possibilities, must be a turquoise mohair cape. A small jowly dog, coughing and wheezing like a Romanian asbestos miner who's taken early retirement, peeps out from beneath a prodigious armpit. She never puts it down, and I have to concede the possibility that it may be surgically attached. Crowds of people are enjoying a drink in the sunshine outside the bars on Key Street. As I settle at a table on the corner, I'm struck by how many visitors seem to come from Northern Ireland. There's a group of five women across the street, drinking in loud voices. A family with hyperactive, hungry children, arguing about burgers and two tough-looking men in their thirties lurking behind pints at the table next to me. All have Belfast accents. One of the guys notices me listening to his conversation and catches my eye. How are you? Half an hour later we've had two drinks and they've explained to me why there are so many Ulster accents on the streets of Galway. It's marching season in the north and lots of people like to get away from the mood of confrontation. I'm presuming they're from one of the nationalist areas, but how can I find out without sounding too obvious? I'll have to be tactful. So, um, you must be Catholic then. Oh, now why on earth did I say that? Am I fuck? Oh, God, this is where they take me off to a piece of wasteland and put a bullet through my head. But his friend is laughing instead. I am... But he's a prod. We come down every year, make a weekend of it. Same again, is it? Sometime after dark, but before morning, Billy, Pat and I find ourselves in the upstairs room of a backstreet pub that I couldn't find again if my life depended on it. A semicircle of men who look like history teachers and professors of linguistics are playing a traditional session. The crowd is the usual mix of solemn Scandinavian, German and Mediterranean tourists at the front and Irish at the back. The couple at the table next to us, a heavily made up woman in fur fabric animal prints and a man with a Ron Atkinson haircut and a Des Lynham moustache, look like low budget Hamburg porno stars whose best years are behind them. The sour-faced ex-stud keeps throwing us looks of disapproval and shushing us for talking. He's looking daggers as an enormous blond man, in an interesting variation on the shell suit, goes up and stands next to the musicians. Good evening! I am from Copenhagen, and I would like to sing for you a song. Suddenly, he launches into the leafing of Liverpool. The Irish people at the back have stopped talking now and are watching with keen anthropological interest. So veer ye well, mine own true love, when I return, united we will be. It's not the leafing of Liverpool that leaves me, but my darling, when I finger thee. There's a big cheer when he finishes, but not, I fear, for the reasons he thinks. 
Billy looks across at the tables of benign, well-behaved, affluent European tourists. That's the great thing about the Troubles. Keeps all these stupid bastards away from the North. Right. Whose round is it then? It's a glorious day as I drive west out of town and into Connemara to Rosseville and the ferry for the Aran Islands. I'm making the detour to Inishmore to visit Father Dara Malloy, who came here in 1985 to assist the parish priest. But the elemental nature of the island and its history as one of the major cradles of early Celtic Christianity led him to reject the Roman Church and begin to practice his own brand of Celtic spirituality, which I don't think was what the bishop had in mind when he sent him. Inishmore has a population of about 800, and its narrow lanes are pleasantly deserted. Seabirds and seals are sunning themselves at the water's edge. Tiny postage stamp fields stretch off into the distance, divided up by more dry stone walls than I've ever seen. Large parts of the fields are simply giant slabs of grey limestone. The ruins of thousand-year-old churches built from the same rock dot the hillsides. The entire landscape is a breathtaking study in elemental grey and green. And in a little hut near the foot of a hill, I buy a hand-knit sweater from a lady who tells me she makes them for Sharon Stone. By mid-morning, I'm examining a primitive Celtic cross with Dara Malloy. He's in his forties with thick, dark, greying hair and beard and exudes a gentle charisma. The tiny piece of land between his house and the beach is rich in ancient sites. Standing stones and Celtic crosses, a holy well, a salmon pool from Irish mythology, a Viking burial and an unconsecrated children's cemetery. By imposing uniformity of worship, stripped of cultural and geographical connections, he says, Christianity created the first multinational product. Just as McDonald's is recognisable no matter where it is in the world, so Christianity did the same. In fact, he reckons, it was Christianity that gave McDonald's the idea. I wonder if the local priest had him tarred and feathered when he turned up here saying things like that. We climb up to an ancient ring fort from which the island looks like a block of sheer stone, the patches of grass just lichen on a rock. A goat is bleating in the distance. This is one of my favourite places on the island. The Celts believe that our world and the spirit world are very close and that there are particular places of energy where the divide is very thin, where it's possible to step across to the other side. I think this is one of those places. It seems like a good place to ask the renegade priest the million-dollar question. So, do you believe in God, then? I'd have to say my beliefs have changed in the 15 years I've been here. I absolutely believe in a spirit world. I believe we're close to it here. And I believe religion should serve the people from the ground up, not from the top down. It must nurture their souls or it is nothing. But as to whether once my body's in the ground I'd be conscious of myself as a separate entity, I'm not sure I will. Perhaps you'd have to say I was an agnostic. I've never met an agnostic priest before, so I feel I should tell him what the country and western detective novelist Kinky Friedman has to say on the subject of belief. I'm a Jehovah's bystander. We believe in a supreme being, but we just don't want to get involved. On our way down from the top of the island, Dara says something that I think may have made sense of my Anglo-Irish identity crisis. I'm in a restaurant in Kong, County Mayo, where the vegetable of the day is Mexican potatoes. The meal is a colourful mixture, possibly put together by someone in the throes of a nervous breakdown who's locked himself in the kitchen and cooked everything he could find. 
When I went to the loo a few minutes ago, two hysterical teenage girls burst out of the living room with lollipops stuck up their noses, sticky end first. Now, I'm reading the newspaper. He was walking down the middle of Washington Street. He was as totally naked as the day he was born. These were the words spoken by Garda Rice as he gave evidence in court. The report continues. The two Gardai were on a midnight patrol in the city centre when they came upon the two nude doctors, a court sitting was told. Two British doctors, a cardiologist and a psychiatrist, both of whom are due to sit examinations to be consultants, were in Cork on one of their stag weekends when they walked about naked in the city centre just after midnight. The report is worrying on two counts. It reminds us once again how naive we are to entrust our health and well-being to ex-medical students. Why on earth do doctors drink so much? Well, I suppose it gives them something to do while they're smoking. But more troubling than the professions of the inebriated nudes is their location and the fact that they weren't the only ones at it. Three other English visitors for stag parties that weekend were arrested for being nude in public in Cork. It brings to mind the South Uist hedgehog catastrophe. There were no hedgehogs on the island of South Uist in the Outer Hebrides until 1974, when some bright spark imported seven of them in a disastrous attempt to control the slug population in his garden. Today, there are an estimated 6,000, advancing ever northwards in a relentless spiky tide that cannot be resisted. And, as they progress, they're devouring the eggs of rare birds, and so inflicting dramatic and permanent upheaval on the fragile eco-balance. The unsettling case of the nude English doctors suggests to me that something akin to the South Uist rogue hedgehog scenario is happening with English stag parties in Ireland. As flights get cheaper, nowhere is safe. Dublin is saturated. It can take no more Londoners in false rubber breasts, no more comatose brummies chained to lampposts with swarfiga on their genitals, no more nude doctors. So now they have spread to Cork. Waterford will be next. The Irish way of life is under threat as never before. Unless a nation is prepared to make a stand, Hopelessly bladdered doctors may achieve what a thousand years of English landowners, politicians and soldiers could not. It's ten to eleven and I'm getting into bed with wine-stained lips when the sound of a car breaks the silence outside. As the engine continues to rev, the doorbell rings. My room is downstairs right next to the door, so I consider answering it. But as I'm in a bad mood, naked, with purple teeth and lips, I decide to let events take their course. A voice pounds through the darkness. Excuse me, I know it's late, but do you have a room? I'm afraid we're lost. We just arrived in Dublin today. Dublin? God in heaven, it's the entire width of the country away. How the hell did they manage to end up here? Well, I have just the one room, with a double entrance. Is that four? It is. Okay, we'll take it. Oh, Anna, could you tell me, where are we? Mio. Excuse me? Mio. All right, so is this where the sandwich dressing comes from? I don't understand. Mayo, you know, like tuna mayo? The journey from Kong to Lewisburg is one of the most dramatic stretches of road in the country, surrounded by some of the most spectacular mountains in Connemara. Heading north through the mountain pass that runs along the eastern edge of Du Loch, there's a stone monument at the side of the road. I pull over onto worryingly boggy ground and walk back to read the inscription. To commemorate the hungry poor who walked here in 1849, and walk the third world today, it says. And suddenly, I know where I am. It was through this valley 
that more than 150 famine victims walked in the depths of that winter. In Westport, they had been refused sustenance at the poorhouse until they had registered with the poor commissioners, who were 14 miles away at Delphi House. In ferocious conditions, they walked to Delphi, only to find that the commissioners were having dinner and would not see them. Dozens died in the snow in this beautiful but desolate place in the shadow of Ireland's holy mountain, Crogpatrick. The Reek, as the mountain is also called, dominates the whole of this corner of Mayo. Its near-symmetrical pyramid form is like the blueprint for an archetypal mountain, the resonant shape of a fairy tale peak from a storybook. It's here that St. Patrick is said to have issued the exclusion order banishing all snakes from Ireland when, in 441, he spent 40 days and 40 nights fasting at the summit. The mountain towers over the islands of Clue Bay, the small but perfectly formed town of Westport, and McCarthy's Pub, which is where I'm staying. It seems a pity to be so close and not give the holy mountain a go. The morning sky is Corfu blue as I have my orange juice, muesli and coffee with a massive cooked breakfast. In the paper, it says a bloke died on Crogue Patrick last Sunday. 51 he was. Seems they had to bring him down in a helicopter. Within two minutes of beginning my ascent, I have severe chest pains. We could be looking at another helicopter job here. It feels as if the sausages, black pudding and hash browns have lodged in some crucial aperture, like a, a wedge of damp cardboard, as they try to penetrate my system. It occurs to me that for days now I've been on a strict diet of fried breakfasts and Guinness. That'll explain the tingling sensation all down my arm then. The path rises sharply from the statue of St. Patrick at the foot of the mountain. I'm trying to walk off the heart attack, but so far it's not working. I stop for a rest by a large rock, on which there's a child's abandoned Doc Martin boot. Perhaps it's a sculpture. Suddenly there's a noise and a sweaty, grey-bearded man in running kit comes charging down the slope. Sacred jogging. It could catch on. There's another guy across to my right, way off the track, standing in a ditch. He's wearing shorts patterned nylon ankle socks and plastic sandals, and he's filming massive close-ups of Heather with a camcorder. So close to the car park and bonkers already. I'm going to treat this mountain with respect. Halfway up, as you reach a ridge, the wind suddenly kicks in. From here, as well as looking north across the islands of Clue Bay, you can also see south to the mountains of Connemara. For a while, you're walking along a narrow plateau from which the ascent to the summit looks difficult and dangerous. Up to my right is the towering granite of the mountain, lined with what look like giant finger marks, as if someone's fallen off, then clung on, scraping the side as they fell. The final ascent to the summit is a steep one, scrambling over loose rock that's been badly eroded by the constant passage of pilgrims. As I'm taking a breather and munching on a life-enhancing apple, a grey, poorly-looking man comes crawling up the slope. He appears to be suffering simultaneously from a severe hangover, cold turkey and terminal TB. <coughs> Do you have a fag? I'm gasping. Gasping is seriously underestimating the situation. He sounds as if his internal organs are about to rupture like badly perished rubber bands. As he wheezes and rattles like a consumptive beagle on a tobacco baron's treadmill, his flickering, unfocused eyes suggest he may also be in the advanced stages of myxomatosis. It's a mystery how he made it this far. Perhaps he had a coughing fit and fell out of a passing helicopter ambulance. I offer him half a bar of chocolate and he turns and heads back down. Crogpatrick has been a place of Christian pilgrimage for over 1500 years, but archaeological evidence shows that the summit was occupied by a ring fort and at least 30 huts long before St. Patrick's time. Today at the peak there's a small white church and the ruins of an early Christian oratory. As I hit the summit, 
40 or 50 people are milling round, taking photos, eating picnics or praying in the bright sunshine and fierce wind. A worryingly batty man in his 30s is whacking pebbles a long way up in the air with a hurley stick. On high mountains, as on high buildings and underground railway platforms, it's always best to keep an eye out for the loon who might want to nudge you off. I take refuge in the church. There's a little vestry on one side of the chapel, packed with bottles of mineral water, bags of fruit, muesli and Kit Kats, and some canvas and oil paints. It all belongs to Chris, the mountain's artist in residence. No, honestly, Chris is nearly three quarters of the way through a 40 day and 40 night stint on top. He says his presence is a social sculpture in memory of mystics of the past. Locals are betting on how long he'll last. While we're talking, someone comes to tell him that a curry is on the way up for him tonight. And yes, there will be poppadoms. Plain or spicy? Probably a selection. On the way down this afternoon, I saw a kid crying because he couldn't go any further, a freckly, ginger-haired, baldy bloke in purple shell suit bottoms, flip-flops and nothing else, and an Englishman shouting at his children that they'd all bloody well go back down again if they didn't bloody behave. A breathless fat guy smiled and asked me if they had a table for four up there. So now I'm relaxed, well-fed and luxuriating in the afterglow while all around me, people are waving stools over their heads. A tall, enormously fat man in a custard yellow shirt that would be a floor-length dress on anyone else is throwing a pear-shaped woman around the room, and a table load of 18-year-olds have moved a birthday cake off the table so they can dance on it. In a minute, they'll dance on the table. The crackometer is 98.6 and rising. A quick hobble around Westport earlier confirmed my suspicion that a musical apartheid system is in operation. A dozen or more bars were playing host to mild-mannered, respectful European tourists listening to introspective diddly-die music. But back here in McCarthy's, just a hundred yards but several worlds away from the town's traditional music pubs, the shocking truth about Irish music lies waiting to be discovered. I've come in for an 11 o'clock nightcap and the place is going berserk. Everyone's on their feet, apart from the young guy at the table over there who's having a haircut while a semicircle of raucous women roar in encouragement. In fact, everyone in the place is roaring or howling or whooping. On stage, a man with black nylon hair matching chin-length sideboards and Roy Orbison glasses, is strumming a guitar in accompaniment to a drum machine that's going through the full repertoire of cymbal crashes, tom-tom rolls and big bass flourishes. It's clear that the traditional music he's playing is touching something genuinely heartfelt in his audience. The stools, by the way, are above their heads, so they can be waved in time as the whole room sways and sings along to Daydream Believer. In the middle of the room, a wee kind of village idiot man is cavorting on his own and playing the spoons badly. Mind you, anyone would today dream believer. Then it's Waterloo, Mamma Mia, half the lad's hair is off now and he's snogging the hairdresser. And now it's can't help falling in love with you. And everyone's dancing and smooching in groups of three or more, experience having taught them that more legs means greater stability if balance becomes a problem. So this is what goes on away from the carefully stage-managed image laid on for tourists. In the traditional music pubs, when the last Italian and German have left, and the fiddle and the baron have been safely put away, they'll draw the blinds, breathe a sigh of relief, and crank up Abba and Neil Diamond. Slowly, I edge towards the door through the pulsing crowd. The man mounted in the yellow shirt is hand-jiving to Crocodile Rock now, but outside, it's still Ireland as we know it, or as we've been told it is, 
with no clues as to what's going on behind closed doors. I edge a few yards along the street to the front door that leads to my pine-clad room and safety. In the small hours of the morning I wake, suddenly in a sweat, to a moment of blinding revelation and sit there in the dark, trembling. Maybe the holy mountain has worked its magic after all. The village idiot with the spoons? Of course, it was Bono. The musician in the nylon wig and shades? Christy Moore. The big fat guy in the yellow shirt? Van Morrison. They don't fool me. But they needn't worry. The dark secret of Irish music is safe with me. Side four. On a map of the world drawn in 1492, the only place named in the whole of Ireland and the country's most prominent feature is St. Patrick's Purgatory. Purgatory is located on Station Island, out in the daunting six-mile expanse of Loch Derg, surrounded by the low, partially wooded, heather-clad mountains of mainland Donegal. It's the only one of seven medieval purgatories, places of rigorous and extreme pilgrimage, to survive. The earliest pilgrims to record their experiences here were medieval knights and monks from England, France, Spain, Hungary and other parts of mainland Europe. They wrote of spectacular and miraculous visions experienced in the cave in which pilgrims were then confined. Although the 15-day fast was reduced, first in 1517 to nine days and then in 1804 to three, the form of prayer and ritual of deprivation to which the present-day pilgrim must submit is the same as it has been for many centuries. In 1200, Peter of Cornwall, a regular visitor, wrote, Beware, no one leaves Loch Derg without some loss of mind. I see it for the first time as I round a bend. A huge arch bridges the road. St. Patrick's Purgatory, say the letters, spelled out against the dark, brooding, swirling sky. Across the steely grey water, through the relentless rain, the island and its penitential buildings loom like a miniature St. Alcatraz. I stand in the drizzle by the car and assemble a modest overnight bag. With a heavy heart, the chocolate, the peanuts and the hip flask of Jemison's are dumped in the boot along with other prohibited fripperies, like shoes. I pack a book on the remote off chance that reading isn't banned and walk across to the ticket office where I pick up a leaflet. The fast continues for three full days and ends at midnight on the third day. The vigil is the chief penitential exercise of the pilgrimage and means depriving oneself of sleep completely and continuously for 24 hours. Having arrived on the island, the pilgrim goes to the hostel, removes all footwear, and begins the first station. There are then three pages detailing the unimaginable quantity of praying, kneeling, and sheer physical punishment involved. I tell the girl on the desk, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to take this. She tells me, there are priests over there if I need any advice, or first aid. As I walk across to the boat waiting at the jetty, my stomach rumbling alarmingly, it occurs to me that, at this precise moment, no one on earth knows where I am. Half past eight in the evening, day one. Seven hours I've been out here and I feel terrible, dizzy, woozy. I'm already thinking of packing in and leaving early because A, I feel foreign, B, I feel dishonest, and see, there were other reasons, I know there were, but I'm too spaced out to remember them. The only glimmer of hope has been the discovery that the fast isn't total. 
Each day, at a time of your choosing, you're allowed one meal of black tea or coffee or hot water with dry toast or dry oatmeal crackers to be taken in the canteen. Arriving earlier today felt like coming to a prison. We landed in front of grey, austere buildings like Ireland used to be but isn't anymore. Huddles of barefoot people stood near the jetty, hunched against the grim August climate, smoking and chatting, scanning the new arrivals for friends, relatives or anyone with a file in a cake. As well as the sleepless vigil and the fasting, we have to make the stations on the penitential beds. The beds are the rugged stone foundations and ruins of ancient monastic cells, around, over and among which one must trample, and there are a worrying number of them. As if this wasn't enough, you also walk four times round the outside of the basilica, kneeling at various points, embracing various crosses, and then stand, pray, kneel, pray and pray on the rocks at the water's edge. All barefoot, mind. And when you've done all that, you've done one station. While you're here, you have to do nine. A quick calculation suggests that the conscientious pilgrim will rack up a minimum of 2,421 prayers. I'll double-check this figure later, if conscious. Potential cartilage damage, of course, is incalculable. Walking along the pathway towards the first bed, the slap of bare sole on wet concrete was refreshing, though I could see how it might grate after a while. Suddenly, two priests walked past me, all in black, smiling and wearing shoes. So, we're not in this together then. They're in charge and we're in pain. I wonder if they sidle up and give you a sly stamp on the toes if you're not performing up to scratch. Five past midnight. My feet are freezing and my knees hurt a lot. I fear they may have rising damp. When I got to the dorm, there were two fat guys getting layered up with fat clothes. They were discussing Chinese food with an intensity that bordered on sexual fantasy. They were clearly mad with hunger. The mention of Kung Po prawns had one of them bent double, grimacing with lust. They're making elaborate plans to break their fast with a spectacular blowout of satay chicken, crispy duck, sweet and sour pork, beef in black bean sauce and chilli crabs to be delivered to their front doors at midnight on Sunday. I'm sitting in the night shelter where we can come between prayers if we don't fancy wandering around outside barefoot in a pitch black howling deluge. Opposite me, there's a bony woman who looks like she works in a fish shop. She's wearing leg warmers, which she's pulled down so that they cover her feet. That can't be allowed, can it? She's cheating. It's not fair. I find myself wanting a priest to come in and confiscate them. This thing is beginning to take on a momentum of its own. Even if you don't buy into the philosophy, once you're here, you find yourself playing it by their rules. Something inside you takes over and it becomes a matter of pride. You want to succeed, to score the points, to finish the race, to accumulate the prayers. If they can do it, so can I. Ten to two in the morning. Another break after completing one of the stations inside the basilica. It's done aloud, communally, but you have to walk around as if you were still outside, so there's hundreds of people milling around, walking up and down aisles and staircases and pews. There are some of those really annoying spiritual clever dicks who jump in early with their responses before the priest's finished his bit, then gabble through the prayers dead quick to make sure they get to the end before anyone else does. Someone should give them a slap, but if they're not even confiscating illegal leg warmers, then I can't see that happening. It's a strange, chaotic hubbub of a scene, compounded by the fact that some people are praying in English and some in Irish. I'm feeling more alien here than I have anywhere else in the country. Earlier on, the enforcer, the bad priest in the old good priest, bad priest routine, gave us a little talk from the altar, warning of the danger of giving in to the temptation to lie down or stretch out. 
On no account must we do this, but nor must we be surprised, he said, if people around us fall asleep standing up. In a carefully calculated piece of psychology, the enforcer was followed by kind priest, warm smile, white robes, guitar, who, after beginning with a bizarre sermon about saving Private Ryan, got the crowd back on his side by suggesting that the weird green mould and bacteria that were rampant in medieval bread had similar chemical properties to LSD and would have accounted for the hallucinations experienced by pilgrims in the cave. Present-day pilgrims, he suggested, weren't attracted by the prospect of psychedelia, but by a spiritual experience that's increasingly out of sync with the mood of go-ahead economic boom-time Ireland. There was a strong murmur of agreement, followed by the distinctive sound of a couple of hundred people crashing down onto damaged kneecaps for another 73 prayers. I've decided that at 10 o'clock tonight, I'm going to be right next to the door when the last service ends, so I can run to the dorm and be wrapped up and asleep before most of the other sleepy buggers have left the church. I've also begun fantasising about how nice the rest of my life is going to be once this torture stops. I find a place on a bench and try to read, but suddenly Skinhead, the enforcer, is back. He's been missing most of the night. Six hours sleep at least, I reckon he's managed. His shoes are looking well polished and watertight. If there were a spontaneous popular uprising among pilgrims who just couldn't take it any more, he'd be the first up against the wall. Brawls would break out on the penitential beds as malnourished, hallucinating farmers fought over his socks. I make a point of standing on his foot as I walk past, but through leather that thick, I shouldn't think he noticed. Twenty past nine in the morning, second day. Back in the basilica, a dozen priests in white robes and comfortable-looking shoes are lined up ready to hear confessions, but I'm afraid this is a bridge too far. Isn't it enough that our knees are going to need reconstruction by Donegal's top plastic surgeons without adding the ordeal of near-public admission of guilt? I've got two more stations to pound out today if I'm to keep on schedule. It's not as crowded as yesterday, so you don't need as much vicious elbow work to get you into the holy places. But soon the rain's driving down again, my feet are slipping on the stones, and my knees are feeling 25 years older than the rest of me. This really is brutal. Yet I've started taking a frankly perverse pleasure in the physical discomfort. Oh, wow, that one hurt my foot. Good. Here comes that nasty, slippy one with the jaggedy edge. Excellent! I'm surprised to find I'm not dying for a pint. Half past five in the afternoon, second day. The problem is that once you've had your meal for the day, there's nothing else to look forward to. It's all downhill from here. Outside, there's the first glimpse of sunshine in two days. There's a queue of people at the holy water trough, filling up mineral water and body shop bottles. A big-boned woman from Cavan is wearing a dry cleaning bag as a waterproof. I'm sitting on a bench, looking across the water to the mainland, flexing my pulverised knees and reading. Sometimes you enjoy a book so much that you have to ration the pages to make it last. I make myself stop with 22 pages to go so there's something to look forward to at bedtime other than 47 men snoring. Eight o'clock in the evening. we just had sung mass in the basilica, and now I'm starving again. I'm not sure what the medical term is for having two limps at once, but whatever it is, I've got it. Five past ten, and our sleepless vigil is over. I was in the lead group of thirty or so who were first out of the basilica and scampering up the hostel staircase, raw feet slapping on the cold, precast concrete floor. I'm already in bed as some of the guys are still arriving in the door. The little bachelor across the room there is taking faded Winsiet pyjamas out of his antique suitcase. He'll never get them on over that Mac. Now, where was I? Page 365. The bastards have turned the lights off. 
There must be a central switch somewhere, operated by some vindictive cleric. He'll be lying back in a big leather armchair with a Cuban cigar and a tumbler of Armagnac, watching reruns of Baywatch. He can just stretch out a well-rested leg and plunge us into darkness with the toe of a hand-tooled brogue, then stroke the Persian cat on his lap and dial room service for a club sandwich. Twenty past ten. Can't get to sleep. Half past ten. Well, this is great, isn't it? I'm tired and aching like I've been awake for a month, being dragged face down over cobbled streets behind a turbocharged Land Rover driven by mad Frankie Fraser. But can I get to sleep? No. I'm just lying here, staring at the big beefy bloke across to my left, who still hasn't budged or made a sound. Maybe he's playing possum and taking everything in. He could be an informer, waiting his moment to see if anyone has a sly snack or goes to sleep with their hands inside the bedclothes so he can report them to the enforcer first thing in the morning. I try counting sheep, but I don't think that's ever worked for anyone, has it? I know. I'll count Paisleys instead. Little Ian Paisleys jumping over a stile. Oh, hang on. He's refusing. Won't jump it. Won't even discuss it. Right. Better get the cattle prod then. Oh, there he goes. And another. Three Paisleys. Four. God, you wouldn't want to be stuck in a lift with all of them, would you? Five Paisleys. Six. Seven. Twenty past six in the morning. Final day. Woke just the once in the night with a start to a terrifying sound. Took several seconds before I remembered I was in a room full of battered and exhausted religious fanatics. Forty-seven malnourished men can make a surprising amount of noise. Just a dozen more paisleys, though, and I was fast asleep again. By the time I made it to the bathroom, it was full of the midnight snorers, all in old-fashioned underpants, stripped to the waist and smelling of toothpaste and non-sissy soap. I padded round for a bit in other people's drips to soothe my aching feet, then joined the wave of humanity rolling towards the basilica under startling clear blue skies. The penitential beds were empty because no one is allowed on them till after mass, do you hear? I found myself walking next to Seamus, my bunkmate. He said he's not tired. He reckons that Eating uses up a lot of energy, you know, with all that digesting. So, the less we eat, the less tired we become. Hmm. Noon, day three. The lake is shimmering like the Mediterranean under a bright sun as we cross back to the mainland. If it were a film, this would be a grotesque cliché, sin and gloom transformed into grace and sunlight by the redemptive magic of the pilgrimage. As it's actually happening, I'm doing my best to ignore its symbolic significance and just enjoy the weather. I can't deny, though, that I am feeling good. There's a crispness and clearness to things that has nothing to do with the sunlight. This has been powerful medicine. If it can do this to me... What must the true believers be feeling? As we got on the boat a few minutes ago, kind priest was there to shake each of us by the hand, while the enforcer harassed those stragglers who were too exhausted to stand, treading on their fingertips where necessary. I'm only guessing here, obviously. Anyway, perhaps kind priest had picked up on my accent, because as he shook my hand, he said to me, And where are you from? Er, uh, from England. Well, England... And cork. Ah, so where's your home? Well, I'm still trying to work that one out. Good luck to you now. God bless. The family tree is spread out in front of us on the coffee table at my uncle's house just outside Cork City. So far, he's traced it back to 1700. He seems surprised when I ask where he went to access the records. He says it's just from talking to people and from what he already knew. I remember driving through the countryside with him when I was a child. He would point to someone working in a field or walking by the road and tell me that he and I were cousins, second cousins, on my grandmother's side or whatever. 
He made it sound as if everyone was related to everyone else, which, I suppose, in a way we were. One of the first things to strike me about the family tree is that as far back as it goes, the name on both sides is McCarthy. My grandfather and grandmother were third cousins. Oh, of course they were. That's how it was in a time when there was a small population base and no one ventured far from where they were born. We are the first generation to be born overseas. The close-knit patterns of what I'm looking at draw me in. I feel part of something coherent and tangible. As we've all become more mobile and more scattered, this kind of information has become dissipated and lost. One event in particular catches my eye. In the early 1700s, five brothers fled to France from pursuit by English redcoats. My uncle had grown up knowing this story. He says they took refuge in a thatched house that once stood just behind the house in Drimmer League where he and my mother grew up. The soldiers burned it down, but somehow the brothers escaped from Glandor Harbour to France, where they probably ended up cannon fodder for Napoleon, dead in the snows of Moscow. My cousins built a new bungalow, almost on the spot where the five brothers' thatched house once stood. I suppose nothing's ever certain in this life, but he seems reasonably confident the British Army won't turn up and burn this one down. Lost your cat? Try looking under my tyres. It's noon and the Angelus bell is sounding on the radio as I sit reading the sticker in the rear window of the car in front. The traditional call to prayer seems strangely anachronistic in the New Ireland, though I suppose it's possible that the Dublin traffic has come to a standstill because the drivers still feel a spiritual compulsion to observe the holy moment. So perhaps it's prayer, not profanity, making that taxi driver's lips move. Since reaching the outskirts of the city, I've been trying to find the port of Dunleary by faithfully following road signs showing a big picture of a boat. I now know that the only longer route to the ferry port would have involved a diversion via Derry and the Blasket Islands. For my last night in the country, I treat myself to a room with a sea view in one of the 19th century hotels on the waterfront. My boat sails in the morning. The rest of the day is my own. I could go for a look round Trinity College, or a stroll on St Stephen's Green and a pint in James Toner's, or tea at the Shelburne Hotel. To be honest, though, I don't feel terribly motivated to do anything. Up in my hotel room, all the English TV channels are on tap, but it would feel a kind of betrayal to watch the BBC on my last night. The programmes on Irish TV are all crap, though, so I don't watch them either. I just sit with my feet up, looking out on the bay. Next morning after breakfast, I take a stroll along the waterfront to the Martello Tower at Sandy Cove. There's the first chill of autumn in the air, but the sea is eerily still, and the brilliance and clarity of the light make me feel like I've landed in a fictional small-town port that has broken loose from Dylan Thomas's imagination and drifted across the Irish Sea. Georgian front doors are painted rich hues of red, green, blue and yellow. Low, grassy dunes run down from garden gates to the rock pools of the foreshore. A few bright-eyed early risers are out walking or cycling, as if they've been placed in the shot by a director. It feels so perfect, so overtly fictional, that at one point I feel slightly dizzy and stop to sit on a stone bench. As I round the headland at the foot of the Martello Tower, people are swimming in the sea, climbing down the rocks on a metal ladder and diving from higher up. 40-foot gentleman's bathing place, says a sign. This is where the men of Dublin, and latterly I'm told the women, though there are none in evidence today, have traditionally exercised their right to bathe nude. I walk as far as the tower, which is now a James Joyce museum, but I've no mood for museums today. I'm thinking of what Dara Malloy said that day on Inishmore, when we walked down from the fort together, 
He'd been talking about the magic that some places hold, that special feeling that embraces landscape and history and our personal associations, but somehow goes beyond the sum of them. So what, I asked him, about my feeling? Was a true sense of belonging here possible for me? Or was I just another victim of the ruthless marketing of sentimental Irishness? I think everyone has an inner voice, and we can all learn to listen to it. You don't need to analyse where it comes from, but you can attune yourself to it. If you can learn to follow it, it will lead to fulfilment. We walked on down the hill to the road above his house, looking across to Connemara. The Celtic monks would wander around Europe until they found the place that was calling to them. Then they'd settle and make their community there. They had an expression for it. Seeking their place of resurrection. They believed they were beneath that spot in the firmament that would one day lead them to heaven. I'm looking out to sea, watching a ferry coming in, when I realise it's the one that will take me back to England. As I pass the 40-foot pool, a man of 60 or so is sitting on the wall, shirt and trousers on, drying his feet. Ah, what's the hurry? Have a swim, why don't you? You need no togs, nor even a towel. It's the best thing in the world. 25 years I've been doing this, and I never felt more alive. Sorry, I can't. I've got a boat to catch. My parents always told me the best things in life were free. But, of course, I had to go the other way before I ended up swimming here and believing them. I tell you, though, this is the place to be now. What? This pool? No. Ireland. There's a buzz in the air. But people still have time for you, still talk to you. I wish I was making him up, but I'm not. He's real. There he stands, large as fiction, as if he's been sent along by another author to provide my final conversation. He's looking me in the eye, and I know what he's going to say, but he's going to say it anyway. This would be a place for you to live. He holds my gaze for a second or two, then goes back to drying his feet. Good luck now. Yeah, good luck. <laughs>